Hello, welcome to your physics teacher. In today's lesson, I'm going to be showing you how we can derive the range formula given by r equals to v initial square sine 2 theta all divided by g. Now, the best way to remember the range formula is through the game of soccer or football, depending on where you're living, because the range formula has its limitations. It only works for a specific set of conditions. The set of conditions that the range formula only works for is when the height difference from where it's launched to where it lands is zero. And as I mentioned, the best way to think about this formula is to think of the game of soccer. So what we're going to do next, we're going to draw a typical projectile type question where a player kicks the ball and then it lands. Okay, so here we have our soccer player and the soccer player kicks the ball from the ground and we know that whenever the objects are flying in the air, they're going to follow Newton's rainbow, which is a parabola opening down and then it lands. And when it lands, we're assuming that it just stays there for, for now. Now, quick fact is that I'm actually also coaching football, and I like to coach goalkeeping. So this is a very fun example for me to show you guys. So in this case, let's draw the tra trajectory of the ball by using dashed lines. Our goal is to derive the range formula. In order to do that, it's almost approaching this question like we would any question in problem solving which is what I told you before. First thing you got to do is visualize, which we just done. The player kicks the ball. The ball's trajectory is going to be a parabola opening down. And notice next that we have to choose a coordinate system. And usually the best place to put the coordinate system is right where the object's motion begins. Our next step then is to draw the displacement vector. And the displacement vector it's going to be from where the soccer ball begins to where the soccer ball finishes, delta d. Now notice that in this case, there is no vertical displacement, so your displacement of the ball is entirely due to the horizontal displacement component, which is pointing to the right, so we take the convention to be positive. We can write delta d x. And going beyond this, because this is what we're going to be calling the range from now on. So the range is just the horizontal distance cover whenever the ball lands from the same height from which it was launched. So this horizontal displacement, we're going to call the range, so capital R. Then our next step is going to be to draw the velocity vector. So in particular, we're interested in the initial velocity. So notice in this case that the initial velocity is launched at an angle. We can call this angle theta relative to the horizontal axis. This is particularly useful because now we can take our velocity vector and we can find its x and y components in relation to the angle theta. Given that you're more familiar with projectile questions, you can just resolve this right angle triangle and we can find each of the components by using SOHCAHTOA, so our primary trigonometric ratios, and the V initial Y is pointing up, so we're going to take it to be positive, and that means it's going to be V initial sine theta, and our horizontal initial velocity is pointing to the right, so we take it to be positive, and that could be found to be V initial cosine theta. Again, this video is not trying to emphasize how we can break it down. That you should be able to know how to do, or you may want to watch another video to help you out in this particular part. The next part is we have to think about that we're on the planet Earth playing soccer, and because this holds to be true, during this entire motion, the object's going to be experiencing the acceleration due to gravity. So the acceleration vector is always going to be pointing downwards, and it is due to gravity which, because it points downwards, we take the convention to be negative g, and in particular, we can approximate it to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And this whole motion 
took place over some time interval, which we don't know. Hopefully this setup looks familiar to our problem solving method that we've been doing before. And this means that our next step is we're gonna write down the three main kinematic equations of motion. From our three kinematic equations of motion, normally we try to pick the main one to always work with, which is what we're gonna be doing in this case as well. So although we don't have a question to solve, we were trying to derive the range equation. We're going to derive it from the main equation that we've been dealing with, with the, which is the fortune telling one. And like we've done before, from this main vector equation, we know that we can break it down into its two components along the x and along the y separately. And from these two new equations along the x and along the y, we're going to go back to our main diagram and see the things that we can get rid of and the things that we know to be true. Given this initial conditions, we found that along our vertical displacement, it was zero, so delta dy is zero. And because we are on the planet Earth, our acceleration along the y component is going to be due to gravity, so negative g. Horizontally, we know that there's no acceleration since it's only pointing downwards. And instead of the delta dx, we call the horizontal distance cover the range, which we use the new variable r. And our two component vectors for velocity, we got for the x v initial cosine theta and for the y v initial sine theta. So we could replace those instead. So let's go back to these equations and now simplify. My problem solving strategy is always to be working with the x and y components side by side because they do help each other out. Although they are independent of one another, they are connected because of the time. This is very helpful because if we go back to our range formula, notice that our range formula is independent of the time. So we need to find this new equation and we do not want the time interval in this formula. So let's go back and see if we can eliminate the delta t out of the equation. So from the x component, we have the delta t there. And from the y component, we have two delta t's to think about. And from our two equations, now that we found our targets, which is the change in time, we want to substitute it into the other equation. Now the choice, we could go from the x into the y or the y into the x. The simplest case is to work with the y first. So because there are two delta t's in these two terms, we can common factor out the delta t, which gives us delta t brackets v initial sine theta minus a half g and one of the delta t terms because the other one got factored out. This reminds you of zero equals to a times b, which means either a is zero or b is zero. So likewise, we have two possibilities, either the change in time equals to zero or the other term in the bracket equals to zero. And in this case, again, what is our target? We're still trying to isolate for delta t because we already found one of the cases was delta t could be zero. So what is the other case? So we need to isolate for delta t. So let's bring the other term to the other side. Or in other words, we subtract both sides by v initial sine theta. And notice now that there's a negative on both sides of the equation, so we can cancel that out. And to get rid of the fraction, we can multiply both sides of the equation by two. Two times a half is just one. So the left side is g delta t. 2 v initial sine theta. And finally, to isolate for the time interval, divide both sides of the equation by g. So the time interval equals the 2 v initial sine theta all divided by g. 
So that's why we, we want a, an expression for the change in time. The next time that the displacement is zero is when it lands, which is our second possibility for the time interval. So what we're going to do, we're going to substitute in this expression that we found along into the x component. So we're going to do substitution. Okay, now we're almost there at our target of deriving the range formula, but let's just simplify this a bit. Let's put the constant on the outside too. We have a v initial term and another v initial term, so we can multiply those together. And that will give us v initial square. And we have sine theta multiplying cosine theta, all divided by g. Great. Is that the equation? I think we're finished. Mm, not quite. The range formula that we derived is v initial square 2 sine theta cosine theta divided by g. So at least we were close. In order to go further, we do require a bit more math. And you need to know some identities about their trigonometric ratios. So the next step will look like it comes out of nowhere because it really does if you're taking grade 11 physics and you haven't studied uh, identities in grade 12. So it's really unfair for a physics teacher to teach you this, but at least now you get to see where it comes from. So uh, don't be overly overwhelmed. So from our trigonometric identities, which you will learn later on, there's an identity where you have 2 sine theta cosine theta. This is the same thing as the trigonometric ratio of sine to theta. Notice that in our equation that we have so far, there's a 2. We have sine theta and cosine theta. So instead of those terms, we can replace it by sine 2 theta. So let's rewrite our equation. V initial square, sine 2 theta, all divided by g. And now we're finally derived the range formula. So again, the range formula is very tricky because you need to only apply it when the vertical displacement is zero. Otherwise, it won't work. And even to use this trigonometric ratio, sine 2 theta, is not something that you've been working with in math class either. So I'm going to show you another video how we can use this ratio to understand projectiles with vertical displacement of 0. So stay tuned to the next one.